Uh, Dawn, Dawn uh, Kramer is from McGill University originally and has been here. How long have you been here now, Dawn? It's uh, 13 years. 13 years. He's uh, participated, I think, ever since he got here as a leader on the Victoria Christmas bird count or very shortly after he got here and, uh, and definitely can be out seen um, studying the birds, looking at things like when we had the rhinoceros auklets washing up on shore. Uh, he's been very actively involved. And I love the fact that he has created presentations for us on bird behavior that some of us have maybe noticed, but not really studied. And so it's great that he's done the, the studying for us. Tonight, he's going to talk about fear and fleeing. So uh, with that, I will turn it over to you, Don, and you can click the share screen button and away we'll go. All right, that looks more or less okay. Uh, I'm going to minimize that so I can see my slides and move that around. Oops, and also I have to go back to the beginning slide. There we go. The, the slides move along kind of uh, quickly and spontaneously. So thank you, Anne, for the invitation to speak and for your, um, your introduction. And uh, welcome everyone. I hope you enjoy the the talk. Uh, as Anne said, I'm going to talk about fear and fleeing in birds. And most of us who are birders, whether um, very serious or uh, occasional birders, know that when we walk toward a bird, sooner or later it will fly away or run or walk or hop or swim out of the way, depending on where it is. It's such a common occurrence that often we don't uh, think very much about it. We just accept it as part of the way nature works. But when we do think about it, we realize that there are some regular patterns that we can anticipate. For example, where birds are fed or otherwise exposed to a lot of people, we can get quite close before they flee. So I said sooner or later, and that's the, um, they flee later. This one, of course, uh, many of you will recognize the bird feeding area at Esquimalt Lagoon where, um, the birds still flee, but only at a, a meter or two away. We also know that if we make a noise or move fast, we can't get as close, and that, it's, that some species are much harder to get close to than other ones. But we don't know uh, very quantitatively or, uh, or how consistently those patterns occur. Well, scientists have been measuring fleeing responses for some time to help us better understand birds and other animals and how to protect them better. So this evening, what I will do is to review some of these studies and their implications. Hopefully it will make us better birders and better bird protectors, and at least it should keep us entertained for the evening. So the distance at which an animal flees from an approaching person has been a subject of research for a long time. It's relatively easy to measure, and for anyone trying to study animal behavior, it obviously has important implications uh, that you, if you want to study the behavior, it has to be when the animal is not fleeing. So research goes back to uh, 1937 when a Swiss uh, zoo biologist published a paper on the flight response of animals. And subsequently, Margaret Altman, um, a German-American, um, started working in uh, Wyoming, I believe, on the flight distance and publishing on the flight distance of a variety of free-ranging uh, big game animals. And at that stage, it was like comparing the moose to the elk and when the mother has a calf or if it's a bull in rut, um, what are those flight distance distances? But a major advance came in 1986 with the publication of a cost-benefit model of fleeing uh, the authors were Ron Eidenberg and Larry Dill, who were both at Simon Fraser at the time. Larry has retired and moved to the island, so he's, and he's a member of our society, and Ron has spoken to this group on a previous occasion. The model that they came up with was that points out that fleeing has benefits. It can reduce predation uh, risk, but it also has costs, and the costs can be energy expended in fleeing, 
and as well as the loss of time for feeding or other activities such as uh, feeding or caring for uh, young or uh, interacting with a mate uh, or being in a habitat that has uh, less energy costs. And because of this, these, these costs as well as benefits, animals shouldn't necessarily flee as soon as the um, as soon as they observe a, pot a predator or a potential threat, but rather they should wait until the benefits outweigh the costs. So fleeing when a threat is far away has high costs because animals will flee more often under those circumstances. And it has low benefits because the animals uh, wasn't very likely to be captured anyway. So the animal shouldn't flee as soon as it detects that threat. But when the threat gets closer, the benefits of fleeing increase and the costs decrease. Eventually, the benefits outweigh the costs and the animal should flee. So the distance at which an animal starts to move away is usually called the flight initiation distance. Sometimes in the literature, you see it called the flush distance, or there's a variety of other terms that people have used. But here, I'll use flight initiation distance. And often, to save space on the slides, I'll abbreviate it as FID, which is a fairly standard one in the literature. So the way to think about this is that if the flight initiation distance is high, what it means is that the animal uh, is fleeing earlier, that is earlier in the progress of a threat approaching it. And we infer from that that animals that have a higher FID are more wary. The Eidenberg and Dill theory predicts that variables affecting the costs and benefits of fleeing should influence the distance at which the animal flees a threat. So FID should be higher if the animal is likely to be a target of predation, for example, if it's more visible or a highly preferred prey to whatever's approaching it. It should be higher when it's approached by a faster moving predator that might be more likely to catch it. It should be lower when the animal is close to a safe refuge because it won't take as long for it to get to safety. Uh, and it should be lower when it's in a larger group because of safety and numbers. So this model then gives a framework for looking at how flexible fleeing behavior um, can be understood and predicted. It's quite easy, as you can see from these, to develop various hypotheses. And if we use a human as the threat, it's easy to control the stimulus. Now, there are issues about using a human as a potential predator, but there's quite a body of literature that suggests that animals do respond to people as if to a predator threat. So some people, though, presented with these, this complex uh, cost-benefit model might assume that animals wouldn't be able to make the subtle calculations of benefits and costs and subtracting to calculate the difference between them that would be necessary to follow this sort of flexible behavior. But attention to predation risk is very important for animal survival. And flexible responses for animals whose brains are capable of it are also very likely to be important because of the importance of, of wasting time and uh, surviving. So, however, we can't expect that the animals would have detailed um, precise calculations, but are more likely to follow simple rules of thumb that get them close to where they have to be, but aren't necessarily perfect. So some early tests of, the, uh, of this theory that I was involved in with a student uh, when I was back at McGill uh, showed that animals can make such decisions. So this is, a, I realize chip, uh, the woodchucks aren't, aren't birds, but it, I promise you, other than humans, it's the only mammal that I'll show in this talk. So um, what uh, my student Marjolaine Bonenfant showed in, um, in Montreal was that in parks in Montreal, um, animals, uh, woodchucks, when they were approached, uh, de decided how, how soon to run away by how close they were to their burrow. So this graph on the left shows the distance to the burrow. Uh, and this shows the flight initiation distance. So the farther they were from the burrow, the higher their flight initiation distance. And so it shows that indicates that the animals can make some of these flexible decisions. Even more subtle, though, is in this next graph where we did a follow-up study. And Marjolaine approached the woodchucks either from the same side of the burrow as the woodchuck was on. So the woodchuck ran away from her and got closer to the burrow. 
or she ran, came from the other side of the burrow. So the animal to get to its burrow had to run actually toward her, and that would reduce the time of potential uh, con contact. And um, it was rather neat to see that the, uh, the woodchucks had longer flight initiation distances when they were uh, on when she was on the opposite side of the burrow than on the same side of the burrow, and so that's quite a subtle thing. And think a simple rule of thumb would say: flee when a person gets within twenty meters. Oh no, we'll take the distance to the burrow and the flee when you could give a calculation. But no, the animal can take account of this additional information. So um, so we can expect to see some effects of some of these hypotheses that are developed from the uh, Eidenberg and Dill model. So this simple idea and the fact that you can carry out the work fairly simply by uh, getting somebody to walk toward an animal has, and that there are interesting hypotheses developed there has greatly stimulated research on the topic. So I recently checked the citations. So there's over 900 articles now that cite Eidenberg and Dill's model. And when you do a uh, select um, only those on birds, there's over 200 of them. I haven't read them all for this talk, I, I have to admit. Um, but my goal today is to tell you about some of the findings in those articles that I have read. So more specifically, why, what I'm going to try to address is the question of why the flight initiation distance is much greater in some species than in others and how the surrounding environment influences the flight initiation distance within a species, and how does the type of approach that a person or another stimulus makes influence flight initiation distance. And at the end, I'll talk about some of the applications to, um, to birding and to conservation. Actually, I should have really, fo it, the focus will be mainly on the conservation issues, but I think the type of approach um, that one takes will make it obvious how, how it can influence birding and photography. So first, differences among species. So this was a study done in Australia on shorebirds. And what they found uh, is that larger uh, shorebirds have longer flight initiation distances. So this graph shows the average line. Each of these dots represents a different species. And I've illustrated a few of them here. So they go from um, a redneck stint that's uh, that's under um, that's only a few grams in weight up to um, eastern curlews and oyster catchers that are sort of a, that are approaching a kilogram. And overall, there's a general trend, and this has also been shown in other studies. But what you can also see is that there's lots of unexplained variation as well. The eastern curlew has a flight initiation distance of around 130 meters, whereas the oyster catcher, which is only slightly smaller, is, is, uh, has a flight initiation distance of around 40 meters. So there's an effect of mass, and this has been shown in a broader range of birds and other studies, but this is kind of a nice uh, graph to uh, illustrate it. Um, and uh, so there is a, there's a definite trend. But why would that be the case? Well, it turns out that nobody really knows. There is quite a bit of speculation about it and some hypotheses develop. But one, for example, it might be that the larger birds are more likely to be hunted or to have been hunted in recent history. Um, the idea is that the larger birds are more visible and thus they might be more likely to be targeted by predators, but you could make the counter argument as well. Uh, there are arguments that large birds are less maneuverable on takeoff, so they need more time to escape, so they have to start the process earlier. Proportionally, they have lower, larger animals have lower metabolic rates, so they may be less dependent on continuing foraging to the last moment, which would leave them freer to flee. It could be that larger birds, or larger birds are um, longer lived, and that may make them are more risk averse, sort of avoiding risks, because it's important that they be able to reproduce in future years. And then there's the mechanism, if they're not following the, the um, trade-off idea of costs and benefits, it could be that in some cases anyway, the fact that larger birds have bigger eyes and um, which lead to better visual acuity and longer necks, which gets them 
up above the substrate might let them detect a threat sooner. Another variable that's been found to have an influence is camouflage. So in, in this is a study which looked at uh, a variety of species uh, comparing a camouflage species with a related non less camouflage species. And so uh, I've illustrated uh, three of them here. Now there might be arguments about what camouflage is and need to know the background, but they used um, they used uh, humans uh, decisions to try to decide what the camouflage and non camouflage species were, and they did find that there was a a relative difference in the flight initiation distance. So the camouflage species are less likely to be uh, detected from a distance and they allow one of a person to get closer than the non-camouflage species. Within a species, um, they found a similar pattern. So looking at pheasants where the males are brightly colored and not camouflaged and the females are, uh, are likely to blend in much better to the vegetation, males had longer flight initiation distances than females or also the camouflage juveniles. So, why would more camouflage birds have shorter uh, flight initiation distances? Well, one possibility is that um, they can save time and energy by not fleeing early, and it could be that the predator wouldn't see them and would just pass them by. Another possibility is uh, that they could startle a potential predator, and anyone who's nearly stepped on a rough grouse probably has had that uh, experience, startle a potential predator, and in that way, uh, reduce the success of the predators. Another factor that's been shown to have uh, some effect is a latitudinal gradient. So that's a little unexpected, but in this study, a group of collaborators uh, from across Europe, from Southern Spain, so the dots show where the studies were done. The southernmost was Southern Spain. The northernmost was Northern Finland up here. And they, uh, followed the same protocols and looked at the species that were available. So for now, ignore the, the black and white circles there, data from rural and um, urban areas, but I'm going to talk about that a little bit later. But what they found was that this latitudinal gradient um, did have an effect. Uh, so for example, in the rural birds, uh, in southern Spain, the average uh, flight initiation distance was 23 meters, and it dropped to 10 meters in, uh, in Finland, and there seemed to be a regular pattern. But it's also important that there's lots of unexplained variations. So you see the, the scale here goes from 1 to 10 to 100, so it's a log scale. So these are almost a tenfold difference with, of, among the species at any one site. And here's some examples just to give you a better feeling for it. Not all the, st uh, the study species were the same, of course. You don't get the same species all in, in Spain as you do in, uh, in Finland. But here are some of the north-south comparisons. So European goldfinch is illustrated here. In Oslo, we only had a flight initiation distance of only about five meters, whereas in Spain, Toledo, they had about 16, uh, 16 meters. A great tits in Denmark were under six meters, and in Spain, they were about 18 meters. Wood pigeons, this is a very striking one. In Oslo, were around uh, eight meters, went up to about 110 in Spain. And uh, kestrels, Eur 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 Eurasian kestrels, showed a similar difference. <clears throat> so you can ask, why are they shorter at high latitudes? And again, um, it's not really clear, but one hypothesis is that they're under the birds are under less predation stress farther north. And um, the authors had a secondary hypothesis that raptor abundance was lower. And as part of their protocol in doing these studies, <clears throat> excuse me for a second, they measured, <clears throat> they did. Um, stationary point counts of raptor abundance, and they did find that uh, lower, that raptors were fewer uh, the farther north they went, and they incorporated that data into their analysis and showed that um, it did explain some of the variation, but there was still a latitudinal effect even when they took into account the lower raptor abundance. So something's going on, and there's still a question about what. <clears throat> 
So there are a variety of, ex in summary, of, for this section, body size, camouflage, and, and latitude or predator abundance do seem to have some, are some of the cause of species differences, but much of the variation is unexplained. Now let's look at and take into account the surrounding environment. This is, as I said, we'd come back to this latitudinal slide. So the, the, the filled circles here uh, represent rural areas and the um, open circles represent more urban areas. And you can see that there's a consistent effect with the urban uh, animal birds having a lower flight initiation distance than their counterparts in the rural area. And the average line shows that difference. The slope isn't as steep, but it was still was a significant uh, decline. And this matches the experience that uh, many of us uh, have when we compare birds in some of our parks with those we find farther away uh, where there aren't as many people around. The urban rural differences are, were quite strong uh, in some European birds. So I'm illustrating some here just to show you what happens. So mallards, for example, the difference was between five and nearly 30 uh, meters with uh, goldfinches, nine to 21, with uh, great blackback gulls, 25 to 57. So quite large differences. But um, um, they weren't as evident in some other birds. So for example, European robins in Norway, um, the rural ones actually had slightly, that wasn't significant. So it was basically uh, the same uh, flight initiation distance. And also in Norway, um, <clears throat> white wagtails differed very little. And so there was there's quite a bit of variation that isn't really well understood as to why some species differ between urban and rural and others don't. <clears throat> One of the things that might be going on is that uh, in that uh, learning might be involved in those urban rural differences. So we often just casually use the word habituation and it's an almost universal type of learning. When a stimulus is repeated again and again without having negative consequences, the response to that stimulus decreases over time. So a loud bang makes you jump, but if um, it's a construction site nearby and it's going on and on, eventually you don't respond uh, at all or hardly at all to the same noise. And that could be one of the things that happens when um, birds are exposed to people. Initially, they may show a fear response and flee, but eventually, if there's no uh, follow-up effect and no harm done, they may lose that response. So a, a study that was done in uh, Louisville, Kentucky, in um, birds that were exposed to people in parks uh, indicate, gave some indication of that. So, so again, a complicated graph, but you don't have to get all the parts at once. I may come back to some other uh, parts of it. That, but they looked at robins, either adults or recently fledged juveniles, and the black bars represent juveniles and the um, gray bars represent adults. So in this case, you can see that the juveniles had slightly longer flight initiation distances than the adults. So these are sort of each pair is another set of circumstances, how the people were approaching them and, and so on, which I'll talk about, uh, which I'll talk about later. But the effect isn't large, but it's there. And it may be then that juveniles are initially more frightened of people and they learn eventually being in the park that there's not much of a risk uh, from humans walking near them and they uh, reduce their flight initiation distance. This is a study with a more involved uh, human presence. This was in this study, um, there was a, an issue of Atwater's prairie chickens which are a subspecies of greater prairie chickens that's highly endangered. So they were being reared in captivity in order to be released in the wild, but they had a very low success rate and some of the problems seem to be related to, uh, to predation. So um, in this case, so if we look at uh, their graph, so the, this is looking at the flight initiation distance to a person approaching them. These are the wild greater, greater prairie chickens and you can see their flight initiation distance is around 10, 10 meters. 
whereas the recently released ones that had been hand reared, so they had exposure to people, it was under a meter. Well, those aren't going to survive uh, very long. One of the interesting things about this study is, of course, this is a generally a cryptic species, and um, they had radio transmitters on all of them, so they were able to know where the bird was before they um, before they approached it, and that greatly aided the study. And um, they wondered if it was just that the birds had habituated to people, so they actually looked. They did a comparison to the to uh, using a trained dog as well. They got a, a hunting dog to approach them, and again, the wild greater prairie chickens had a much they had a larger flight initiation distance to the dog than they did to people, and it was uh, very substantial. But the hand reared ones also had a had larger one than they did to people, but it was much less. So <clears throat> there was an effect of the rearing uh, situation on flight initiation distance. But there may be other processes that involve <clears throat> that influence the urban rural differences. So there was a study of burrowing owls in Argentina. Um, urban rural differences, uh, there were urban rural differences in flight initiation distance, and they were associated with other behavioral differences. So uh, this is the burrowing owl, and in urban areas, the flight initiation distance was around 17 meters, but it was as much as 52 in rural areas. But then they did two other studies, which were quite interesting. In this one, it's kind of hard to see, but this is the burrow of a burrowing owl. And this is a white mouse, an unfamiliar prey item that was put out um, uh, to look at how long it took the birds to actually approach a potential prey. And the rural birds took much longer, although it's still uh, measured in terms of, uh, of seconds, really. They took much longer than the urban ones to approach the prey. And when they put predator models, a uh, uh, peregrine or um, pampas fox uh, out next to the burrows, the latency to approach also differed substantially between the two. So this suggests that it's not just an issue of habituation, but that um, the, um, the in the urban situation, it favors a personality type birds. And so there is quite a bit of research indicating that in animals uh, have distinct personalities and anybody who knows a dog or a cat knows, uh, knows that very well, but many uh, wild animals do as well. So one of the, so in this case, this is a case in Florida, we also have uh, a lot of urban ones and this sign was put out to sort of warn people about the burrows of the burrowing owls in Florida. Um, but uh, uh, there was the similar situ similar situation to uh, Argentina. So it could be that only the individuals with bolder personalities remain close to people and the more uh, frighty ones uh, leave the area. Or it could also be that they reproduce su more successfully and so that they're young or there and it favors the um, genetic component of personality. But there is the possibility, as indicated by the predator approach, that this... Um, boldness also makes them more vulnerable to natural predators. So this may be a downside of the habituation. We may think it's good if the birds get into a situation where they're not disturbed by people, but on the other hand, they may be less uh, able to uh, avoid natural predators. Now, another thing about, another aspect of the situation is hunting. Now, one often assumes that birds that are hunted are going to be much warier, but there haven't been many studies that actually carefully document whether that appears in flight initiation distance. But there was one Japanese study which compared two towns. In one of them, uh, in both of them, crows were called because they're agricultural pests and uh, also get into garbage and doesn't seems like people don't like them. But in one town, they uh, uh, called them by shooting, and in the other one by trapping. And uh, so this is just indicated it was two species of crows, carrion crow and large build. And so uh, this shows the trap so they could catch multiple individuals. They even had Judas crows in the trap to, uh, to attract other individuals. And in the town where the crows had been shot, their flight initiation distance was uh, very high compared to the other town where they were, where they were trapped. So, Hunting can have an effect, and I think 
many people have a sense of that, but um, um, uh, it would be very relevant to ducks and geese as well, but it hasn't been carefully studied. Now, another aspect of the environment, although this one doesn't quite work out so clearly, um, is that food supply may be very important. And there are two ways in which food supply could uh, influence uh, flight initiation distance. One is that if birds have found a good food supply, that um, uh, increases the cost of fleeing so they should stay longer because they can gain more energy by staying at a place at, a, at where they are instead of fleeing. But on the other hand, animals that are generally in better condition because they have a better food supply, that means that they don't need food as much and they could flee uh, uh, more readily. So this is kind of interesting study when you think about our turnstones here. So it was a study in Scotland on wintering uh, ruddy turnstones. And what they did was uh, in two different locations, they put mealworms out for them at low tide um, for three days. And they knew that the, the, the birds like here were resting on rocky areas and uh, they knew where they were resting. They ate, the birds ate the mealworms. They compared the feeding rate to the control site where there were no mealworms put out, but there was the same disturbance. And um, the, um, uh, the birds that were fed mealworms were eating a lot more. And then the day after they stopped feeding, they looked at the flight initiation distance and the birds that were, had been fed had much longer flight initiation distances than those that hadn't been fed. So um, what their, under, their um, conclusion was that the birds that were provided with this extra food were in better condition. And it was, if you wanna say safer to, um, to flee earlier um, because the, the, the feeding time was less uh, critical for them. So other differences in the surrounding environment that might have been expected to have effects have been either studied less or haven't been consistent. But if we think about it, we realize that food availability, as I mentioned in the previous one, was condition. The distance of animals are from cover. People have tried to look at that. It's not as clear as it was with my woodchucks. Um, the availability of escape routes, similarly. Height in a tree seems not to make much difference, which is surprising because one would expect that the higher bird is in a tree from something that's restricted to the ground would uh, make it safer. Block size can either have no effect or a positive effect or a negative effect. So there's quite a bit of discussion about that. Um, mixed species flocks have been com too complicated to study well. Weather and wind speed come into a few studies. Time of day sometimes seems to have an important. And wind direction, I, I put that one in there because um, as I pointed out, the, the woodchucks, um, uh, responded according to whether they had to run uh, toward the observer or away from the observer to get to their refuge. And if we think about it, for larger birds that uh, have to take off into the wind, there might, from water I'm thinking about, but even on land, it, it may be the same, uh, the wind direction might make a difference if they have to actually fly toward the threat instead of if the threat was coming downwind as opposed to upwind. And I haven't um, as I said, I didn't read all 200 of those studies, but I didn't find any that uh, that considered that question. So um, for many of us uh, birders, how we can get closer to a bird that we want to identify or, or photograph or just see better is important. So what do the studies of how birds are approached tell us? So when I suggested this topic, uh, Anne reminded me about uh, these two books, uh, Good Birders Don't Wear White and Good Birders Still Don't Wear White, um, uh, indicating that clothing color might actually make a difference. And so the question is, does it? So the first, uh, the title of the first book came from a, a well-written anecdote by Sherry Williamson uh, of an event that occurred at the first uh, nesting or known nesting anyway of eared quetzals in uh, southeast in, in the U.S., which happened to be in Arizona, um, and 
they were watching the parent bird bring food to the nest on a regular basis. So you can imagine all the birders that were there with their scopes and their telescopes and so on. Um, but suddenly the bird stopped and showed very serious alarm. And uh, this Sherry Williamson realized that it was it had coincided with the arrival of a new birder in the area wearing a white cap and a white uh, jacket. And uh, she wondered if the bird was responding strongly to that. So she got a um, she got him to take off his uh, hat and put a camouflage uh, cloth um, around his shoulders. And quite soon the bird uh, came back. So uh, it's sort of a, a single anecdote got into the title of the book. But interestingly enough, there's another essay in the same book by another birder, Ken Kaufman, who contributed an essay uh, question authority, good birders sometimes wear white, and he pointed out circumstances in which that might not be the case. But there haven't been as many studies as you would think about what, about uh, clothing color. So one interesting one that's uh, um, been around for a while is this study in Texas, uh, people counting birds in the, in the woodlands in, in the uh, fall and winter have to wear a hunter's orange vest so they won't be shot by deer hunters. But they wondered if that was actually having an effect. And so they did point counts alternating between wearing a, an orange vest and not. And some species showed no effect of it at all. They're shown on the left. And a variety of other species uh, showed that flight initiation distance did increase with the, with the vest color. So, um, Take a moment and just look at those slides. Uh, for some of you, it may be very obvious, and other ones you th might be thinking about the families or the size, and it may not be so obvious what has an effect and what uh, what what joins the ones that are affected and those that aren't affected. And the answer is that all the species that were unaffected had some red plumage on their bodies. Species without red plumage were more wary. And the sample size isn't huge, but it was a very uh, it was a very consistent response, and it's somewhat surprising. It's as though the birds that have red aren't frightened by other red, and birds that don't have red um, may well be. So, the only detailed follow up I know was a study that was done in China. So you can see up in here. Um, I think it's it was the same person wearing different. Com complete outfits of the different uh, colors and testing um, testing birds uh, in China. He, com he again compared urban and rural areas. I've illustrated some of the main uh, species that were studied there. And what was found was that, oh, did I? Uh, yeah, so basically the only color that seemed to have an effect was red. So white didn't seem to have an effect. Red did seem to have an effect, but only in rural areas. And the effect was an increase in flight initiation distance, and it was relatively small, but it was there. So there's been another study in Ohio with a red vest that again showed that red species, species with red were less affected. And again, it was only in winter and not in summer that it worked. And a very focused study was done in Australia on this species, the spiny-cheeked honey eater, which it's not totally obvious, but it has some striking red at the base of the bill there, and the rest of the body is tan. So they had their uh, intruders wear either red or yellow vests, which would be contrasting, they thought, to the environment, one matching the bird and one not, or... Um, uh, tan and olive uh, t-shirts. And what they found was that um, the lowest flight initiation distance was in fact to the red, uh, the person wearing the red t-shirt and the longest to the yellow. So there's some kind of a trade-off between the brightness, or there may be anyway, to the brightness of the clothing and the color that the, the bird pays attention to in its own, within its own species. So on this issue of clothing, color may have an effect. Some studies show an effect, but red rather than white seems to in the study so far, but the effects are relatively small and some may depend on the color patterns of the species. And there's a whole uh, theoretical framework 
uh, for that, which is related to other things like band color. I won't go into now, but you could ask me any questions. Um, and um, one thing that hasn't really been done very well at all is to consider what the background is against what the bird is seeing. So any time that you're talking about uh, camouflage or color contrast, you should consider both the bird's visual system and the background that the color is seen in. And these studies uh, are, are lacking that. And so more research is needed and it could be quite interesting. So another aspect of how birds approach is the direction of the observer's gaze and her or his uh, trajectory in approaching the bird. So one of the first studies on this was um, a study of incubating herring gulls at a field station on an island in Maine. Um, <clears throat> and what they found was that um, when they approached birds um, on the nest, so first, typically, they would the bird would stand up from the nest if they kept approaching. It would then start to walk away, and if they got very close, it would fly away. And but what they did was they compared a um, a direct approach when they walked straight at the bird, or an indirect approach where they indirectly, so they just inter they'd intersect it but weren't approaching it directly. And there was a consistent pattern that if they were making an indirect approach, the flight initiation distance was smaller. So the birds seemed to recognize if a um, person was walking directly to them and interpret it as more of a risk than if they were walking by. But I want to point out they measured the flight initiation distance in the, in the same way. So the trajectory was close enough that it actually got within the flight distance of the birds. And these. Um, Robbins in Louisville also um, had, there was a very interesting aspect of that study. So they compared uh, looking at the bird um, versus not looking at the bird. So they walked directly toward the bird, but they either stared at it all the time they were walking or they um, looked away but, and just kept it in their peripheral vision. So for that, you can compare the blue to the green arrows, and you'll see that looking at the robin um, resulted in a much more substantial flight initiation distance than not looking at it. So that's a um, that's quite a striking pattern. And some of us might, you know, you get interest in a bird, you're staring right at it. Um, and some may not have realized that that might actually be having, uh, be having an effect. But it turns out that it's not just uh, robins in uh, in Kentucky parks. So there's some other study, uh, studies. So these uh, Hadada ibis are an urbanized bird in Southern Africa. They're in, found in city parks and in playing fields uh, where lots of people are present. But even in that case, even in the most crowded uh, locations uh, where they occurred, if a person stared at them as he was walking past, uh, the birds were much lot more likely to show alert behavior than when the person uh, just stared at where they were going. And an Indian study on Asian green bee eaters that are uh, that nest in uh, burrows in uh, in banks like this also showed that if they if the person stared at the nest, a bird bringing food for the young was much much less likely to uh, um, to approach the nest. And there are several other studies. Um, not directly related to flight initiation distance that show that even newly hatched baby chicks can pay attention to somebody looking at a place and, and be alert from it. So it's, um, it's something that we uh, probably ought to take into account more. And it's, uh, it's perhaps a per surprising subtlety um, in the response of, uh, of birds to, uh, to humans. Another aspect of how we approach them is the speed. And so uh, one of the Australian studies compared um, uh, the response of walkers and, uh, to walkers and joggers. So they, they used multiple species. Here's one of them, the main duck. And um, there was a, a jogger results in a longer a flight initiation distance than the walker. So the bird is essentially more frightened, but it's even more striking in the percent that flew away to a walker uh, none of them flew. They tended to just walk out of the way, whereas to a jogger, uh, a third of them actually flew. The eastern rosella, obviously a parrot, um, 
didn't have a very striking flight initiation distance, but there was a strong effect on whether they flew or not. So birds are paying attention to that. And out of the 10 species that they had adequate samples, there was a higher flight initiation distance to the walker than to the uh, to the jogger than to the walker in eight out of the ten species. Not all were statistically significant, but sometimes the samples were a bit limited. So there's a, a trend there. And similarly, nine out of ten species were more likely to fly um, when approached by a jogger than a walker. So speed does seem to make a difference. And what about dogs? So we all have our ideas about how whether dogs affect birds and birding. So one situation where they've been carefully studied is on beaches um, where that are heavily used in summer and are also used as incubation sites for birds. So the snowy plover, plover is a species which is threatened or endangered depending on where you are um, and nests on beaches. Beaches are very popular, especially in the summer during the nesting season. And so um, there's been a lot of concern about how you can't, it's so hard to restrict people from beaches, how big an area should you seal off, does it depend on how the person is approaching and so on. So the flight initiation distance for these birds when they were incubating to a walker was quite small. So in other words, they stayed on their nest until a person was four meters away. Whereas if that person was accompanied by a leash dog, uh, on average, they were they fled at 23 meters away, so a, a really strong effect. And that also translated into a potential effect on nesting success because the um, they stayed away much longer if the if the walker had, had had been accompanied by a leashed dog. But this isn't always the case. So a study that was done in Boulder, Colorado, looking at flight initiation distance, looked at um, uh, vesper sparrows and meadowlarks in the prairies and found essentially no effect. Uh, and in fact, a dog alone, they trained their dog so it could go ahead of them, had a slightly lower uh, effect than a person. And uh, similarly, in the, in the parks in Boulder, uh, American robins had a similar effect. So some cases we see a strong effect and some we don't. And this was another Australian study, though, that shows that there, there was a consistent one, uh, a consistent uh, pattern in this study, and that is they used a standard protocol in which an observer tried to uh, count how many individuals and how many species they had seen in a, in a set um, transect. And so either they, the, the white bar shows if the person just did these counts on their own, or if they allowed another person to walk ahead of them by about 20 seconds. So that's pretty close, but is there any effect? And yes, there was a drop. And the black bars show if the person who preceded them was accompanied by a dog. And then there was, a, there was a, another drop as well. And it didn't matter whether they were in a park where dogs were allowed or in a, a refuge where dogs were not allowed. There was a very similar effect and it affected both the number of individuals seen and the number of species. And this was a, a wider array of, uh, of species that were done there. So there's some effect of dogs, but we have to, most of this, uh, this review is about the effects of people. So we have to recognize that um, people have big effects. And if there's a lot more people than dogs, the effect is going to be bigger. Now, one added complexity that happened as people started uh, working more extensively on the Heidenberg and Dill uh, um, theory is that there was an effect of starting distance. Um, and that is, excuse me for a second, I think I should turn on a light here. It's getting a little bit dark in the room. Maybe I'll even take a brief pause and look at my image to just see if I'm sitting in the right place. Okay, so, um, um, what researchers found in a number of studies was the starting distance has an effect. That is, the farther away an observer starts walking toward a bird, the sooner it may flee or the farther uh, away before it flees. So this is uh, an example from spur-winged lapwings, which I've illustrated here in Israel, 
and it was from one of three of their study sites, but they showed similar patterns. So they had a series of aquaculture ponds and the lapwings uh, spent time around those, uh, not just near the ponds, but in the open areas between them. So they encountered people, but not very frequently. So the uh, closer they were when they started, notice that this isn't zero, this is about uh, 40 meters. Um, the, um, the closer they were, or what should we say, the farther they were when they started, the greater the flight initiation distance. So something about how long, it, how, long uh, how far away the person is has an effect. And they wondered if it was just an effect of people. So up here, it shows a jackal mounted on a, a, a little toy truck that can be remotely controlled. And they had a similar effect to the uh, to the jackal as well. So it wasn't just a, a, an issue with people. So um, this effect has been shown in multiple studies. And uh, at first, it didn't make any sense from the the cost benefit model because you could say, well, <clears throat> if the benefits outweigh the, of fleeing outweigh the costs at 25 meters, it shouldn't matter how far away you you start. But then researchers started to think, well, maybe there is a difference. If someone keeps walking toward a bird from a long distance, the bird has to remain alert so it can't feed as well. It has to monitor that threat. And the longer the approach continues, perhaps the more the bird regards it as a um, as a serious risk. And so it might still fit into the cost benefit model, um, but it's not very clear. But at any rate, the lesson for birding though, is that if you can be close to the bird before you start to approach it, you might get a lot closer than if you're approaching from far away. So that tangential approach might make a difference. Oops, what are we doing here? Um, Computer is telling me that I don't know why it's uh, okay. All right. Um, so, in summary, how the type of approach affects the flight initiation distance. Uh, there are some established patterns that show an increase in flight initiation distance. Red clothing, some of the time at least looking directly at the birds, approaching in a straight line as opposed to indirectly, moving off the expected route. I haven't given an example for that, but there are a number of studies, running instead of walking, having the presence of a dog, and uh, a greater starting distance. But it's amazing if we actually start to think about it, how many open questions there still are. So what about clothing, how it relates to habitat and to the species? And I wonder if binoculars and long lenses actually increase the staring effect so that the birds become more sensitized to them. So it may not be just the feeling of bad luck when you finally get your bins on a bird and then it leaves as soon as you've sort of got a good uh, focus on it. So maybe you'll have to compare birds close up to far away when you're thinking about that effect. And nobody seems to have looked at the very slow kind of stalking approach that uh, birders might take to very gradually move closer to a bird as opposed to a normal walk. I don't didn't find any that have looked at sudden movements, people who wave their arms around when they're when they're talking or make a sudden movement, suddenly take off your jacket or something. What about dogs? Um, if they're on a leash versus running, how big a difference does that make? Do larger groups of observers like the Tuesday birding group have more um, of an effect than just one or two people? Most of the effects have been a single person. There have been a few studies that had two, but no larger groups. And what about noise such as loud talking? And there is a little bit of work on other vehicles like cars and boats. I may talk about some at the end, um, drones and planes, but there isn't really a lot of work on that. Now, some of this work can be applied. And I'd like to give one example of that to just give you some idea of how it can be useful, but how there are some complexities involved. So this study uh, used flight initiation distance and also the alert distance of the birds to try to see how what sort of rules should be for boat approaches to a nesting colony of black skimmers in um, New Jersey. So it turned out that flight initiation distance was strongly affected by the reproductive stage. It was highest during the pre-laying, so the birds seemed 
worry then are more likely to flee, lowest during incubation and hatching uh, when the birds stayed with their nest. And note that in this case, it doesn't mean that the birds that were incubating were less worry, but that they would have had a higher cost of, of leaving. Um, flight initiation distance was greater with direct approaches of the boat to the colony than tangential approaches. And there were some smaller effects of the time of day and some differences between the years. Um, and so then when they, when they got these data, they started to think about, well, hopefully they thought about it beforehand, but what, what, which criteria should they use in deciding the setback distance so they could put out buoys and warn boats to keep away? So first of all, which reproductive stage should they use and which measure? So should they use the first response, such as when the birds are alert or stand up from their nest, or should they wait until they fly? And if they do use flying, should they use the measure that was when the first one flies away from the nest or only when the whole uh, colony flies away? And which statistical component of the measure should they use? Would it be the maximum or the average? And should they add a buffer to lower the risk of error, the kind of precautionary principle? So what they decided on was 118 meters. <laughs> and that is the 95th percentile of the pre-laying distance. So the question of which reproductive stage says it's not practical to change the setback distances over the whole cycle. So they used pre-laying which, in which the birds were most likely to flee at a greater distance. Um, which measure should they use? Well, they recognize that alert behavior might have an effect on reproduction, but it probably would be small compared to flying. So flying away almost certainly will because they'll be trampling of some eggs or young. Um, the eggs will be exposed to heat or cold depending on the weather and also predation from other species. So they decided that they should use uh, flying as a more robust measure. But which statistical measure? So if they did the study many of times, which you would have to many times, which you would have to do to calculate an average. Um, what should you do? Should you use the average? Well, that means that 50% of the birds are going to be affected. Should you use the maximum? Well, maybe there was an outlier where some bird flew off and you didn't actually, uh, it wasn't flying uh, because of your approach, but for some other reason. So they settled on the 95th percentile of their statistics and they thought about adding a buffer, but they didn't actually discuss that. And so, um, so it came out that their suggestion was 118 meters. And they showed that if they use some of the other measures, it wouldn't be too different uh, from that. So, but that shows some of the issues that you have to consider in using flight initiation distance for setback. But in um, multi-species situations, what do you do? So if you go back to that, uh, the study in Australia, well, maybe you should take the biggest one because the others will be, will be safest from there. There was another study in South Africa that showed that flamingos were the largest species, were the most sensitive. So they suggested that that should be the one to be used. But the study on ruddy turnstones indicated that maybe the ones that have um, a, a shorter flight initiation distance is because they're in poor condition and maybe we should be more sensitive to, uh, to those. So study, some studies have shown that alert distance and the physiological initiation distance, that is if you have a, uh, a little backpack on the bird so that you can measure heart rate or stress hormone release, shows that even when the bird doesn't show a visible reaction, there may be some stress uh, responses. And should those be taken into account? Well, maybe yes, but maybe it's just too hard to get the data uh, for that. And the another issue is that it's important to balance conservation needs with tourism needs not because tourism for itself is so important, but it people's close experience to nature may increase support for those restrictions. And also that the rules have to be relatively simple so that they're relatively easy to understand and to, and to uh, enforce. So a rather simple measure, but it's, a, it's still a complex decision process. Now, I'm going to... Um, ask, I'm going to go back to the 
audience here and ask Anne if I can. Anne, are you there? Uh oh. Yes, I, I am here. Sleep. I'm here. Okay, good. Um, I I haven't I didn't start a timer when I began, so I've got one other little section that I could talk about. But if I'm running out of time, I can wait till later or in the questions. Oh, no. What do you think? We're fine. We're just at eight forty. And so yeah, but I couldn't remember what time we actually started. Uh, so uh, because of the discussion beforehand, so we started, right. about, we started about 745, but we're not tight to the, the minute. This isn't, this isn't a university class. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, well, OK, well, I, I university professors tend to profess, so I might tend to yak on and I wanted to be a little bit uh, to check on it. OK, thank you for that. So this one, this last section won't take much longer and it's uh, quite interesting. So one question is, besides conservation setback or buffer zones, um, will it help us to understand how to reduce roadkill and collisions between birds and aircraft? Oh, what is going on here? Um, so I thought that uh, I came across this study fairly late in my in my review, but I thought it was really um, quite neatly done and had some interesting implications. So what these people did was they used a technique that had been used previously to try to understand how uh, people responded to traffic. So it was a, a situation to look at. Um, at people at, at crosswalks when they presented an image of an oncoming uh, vehicle to look at, you know, if they did they judge the size of the speed or whether it had lights on or not lights on. So they used um, brown headed cowbirds and a uh, Ford F-250 pickup uh, um, to carry out this study. So the pickup was filmed. So they put a uh, camcorder down on the road and drove it at different uh, different uh, speeds uh, toward this, put the birds into a room that had a full, uh, a large screen TV over on one side and showed the, the pictures of the oncoming truck to the birds. They used groups of three birds because the birds were more relaxed when they were in groups of three. They didn't feed them during this part, part of the study. But um, so what they did was they drove the, they got, they filmed the truck approaching at speeds of 30 to 120 kilometers an hour. But in the playback, they doubled the speed partly because they were also interested in, um, in airports and airplane uh, effects. So was the, what was the response? So it turns out that the, look at the bottom graph first here, the flight initiation distance hardly changed at all from 60 to 360 uh, mile, uh, kilometers per hour. And so what that means is that the, the birds responded at the same uh, distance, about 30 meters, but because the vehicle was traveling much quicker, if they actually calculated the time to collision, um, and remember, this was a video, so there was no actual collision. No, no birds were uh, injured in this uh, in this process. So the proportion, and they figured that to escape three meters, they needed about um, uh, well, that was I think 0.8 of a second. And so um, the dash line shows that. And so for most speeds over uh, over 90. The birds, or well, let's say over 120, the birds didn't have time um, uh, to escape the uh, the potential collision. So, if this study is uh, cor correct for other species, so we have to uh, it has to be it has to be checked for other species. But even though birds have been shown to respond to the speed in terms of walker and runners. The unexpected speed of a of a large vehicle, whether it's an airplane landing or taking off, or whether it's a truck coming down the road, uh, doesn't seem to be something that they can take into account. So they should be judging time rather than speed than distance, but they're judging the distance. And so the implication are is that is that in especially in conservation areas or areas where birds are potentially gathering on the road, it's very important to to uh, reduce the speeds. And there might be some benefit of some additional uh, warning effect that could that could uh, make the birds be alert uh, sooner 
The study has more subtle details than this. But I thought in itself, it was actually quite interesting to show that the contrast between a natural response and an artificial um, uh, an artificial stimulus. And it looked like the, the, the cowbirds took it as, as very real because their flight initiation distances in this room were very similar to ones that had been uh, studied in the field. So, okay, so now uh, we can uh, stop for some questions if you have any. So I guess uh, I can oh. stop sc screen sharing. Is that sure. uh, stop? Yeah. So uh, stop thank you sharing. very much, Don. That was fascinating. And uh, especially that part at the end, I'm really glad you included that. That was that was a pretty awesome observation. Uh, so there are some comments, some of which you actually addressed later on in your talk in the chat. Uh, Mary has pointed out that um, birds don't seem to like being pointed at too, right? In um, uh -huh. tour groups, they'll tell you don't point at birds. You know, if you have to, if you're trying to give someone a direction, use your elbow, something closer to your body, but an arm out. Is uh, is often perceived as as a threat. As a threat. Um, so that could be the direct. In a way, it's an extension of you approaching in that direction. But right. it could also be the sudden movement. So it would be interesting to look at. You know, if you just flap your arm up, is that as strong a stimulus? I mean, when I was teaching animal behavior, it was very important to. Um, indicate to the students that they should talk softly and that so especially with a bunch of French Canadians in class you had to say don't gesture when you speak you know, <laughs> calmly down and it was it's something uh, if you've done it all your life it's actually hard to hard to do but um, um, it, and several people have commented on um, you know approaching birds slowly that that birds seem to perceive as you mentioned staring at them or raising your binoculars or cameras um, seems to affect them. Um, Aziza said that uh, Conrad Lawrence said that staring at a bird was equivalent to taking aim. And I guess that's that's true. If, if uh, the bird thought it was being looked at by a predator, um, that it would consider that a, a threat, whereas looking away. Mm -hmm. I know I, I know sometimes to approach birds, I've actually walked backwards to get closer. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And that seems to, to sometimes be effective. Uh, so that's interesting. I hadn't recalled. I mean, I read all Lorenz's stuff a long time ago, but I hadn't recalled that uh, that he might have said, uh, might have thought that he might have pointed out that aspect uh, um, way back then. So that's really quite interesting. Yeah. Uh, so any questions or thoughts that others would like to share? Come on, I know someone out there wants to say something. Thomas. Go ahead. Thanks. Really interesting, Don. <clears throat> I have a couple of short questions. Um, the first, just to follow up the cowbird. Um, I mean, quite realistic, your talk is focused on uh, the visual modality, but uh, birds are also here. And I, I'm just wondering about the sort of the, how meaningful it would be to bring a truck visually from 30 to 300 kilometers per hour without the appropriate sound, because there's a Doppler effect. I'd be really surprised that the birds aren't integrating that in terms of making a decision. And, and that they all responded virtually the same way might simply mean that the visual modality was not going to be sufficient to sort of produce a more normal response that you might find on a road or something. Yeah, well, in a way they, uh... Well, they didn't approach it. They, they did actually try to look at the looming response. They tried to increase the profile of the truck to see if that greater looming effect had a bigger effect, and it didn't. But they weren't sure if uh, they they couldn't put enough loomings and have the driver still drive at 120 uh -huh. kilometers an hour toward a camera on the road. Um, and so, but they did comment that the sound effect might be um, might be important as well. And so, uh, yes, I didn't mention it there, but I did mention uh, earlier. I think there's um the the sound has been um, ignored in general. Like if people are really talking loudly, you know, in birding, or if you're if you're birding quietly and someone else walks by talking loudly. Um, the, what is the effect? And I think that could be um, important to uh, study quantitatively. Right. 
Uh -huh. Yeah. Um, yeah, interesting. Uh, and the other short uh, issue, uh, um, and I, I know you've focused on diurnal aspects of it, and um, I spend quite a bit of time at nighttime uh, uh, with night viewing devices in which you can approach a bear or a sawat owl to literally touching distance at nighttime, and they are completely cognizant of your position. And, but if you tried to do that in the daytime, you couldn't, your FED would be so high that the owl would be gone or the bear is gone long. So the issue is that they're evaluating your sensory modality at nighttime, right? Because these, certainly the owl can see at night and bears know, maybe not visually, but they know from all factories. So, so there is additional component, not only sort of within an individual of basically that, perception of what the approaching threat actually has the capability of perceiving, right? Because that, those saw it that I approached literally, you could go right up like this at nighttime and they would look at you like this, et cetera, right? And the only reason, reason that they would do that is because they are working on the assumption that you have no capacity of seeing them, et cetera. Because in the daytime, you can never do that. So, so anyway, not 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 a criticism. I'm just saying that there's a uh, at the level of individual, there's probably a level of complexity with regard to light levels, right? From daylight to crepuscular to to nocturnal, that probably uh, in, mm -hmm. results in a, a very different FE, FID, right? For the same individual. Yeah. Well, I think that's a that's that's an interesting point. I think a very valid one and um worth following up but also to think about birds that are inactive on a roost at night as well um, they generally go somewhere that's potentially safer and are not expecting to be um, approached and they may not be able to perceive either visually something if it's not making a lot of noise so i think there might in terms of disturbance i mean certainly um, some nesting colonies of birds could be disturbed by um whatever party goers on a beach late at night or something like yeah. that and um possibly by by natural predators as well so i think the whole mostly when people have done it in time of day study time of day they've just looked at through the sort of the act of the the well-lit part of the day and they haven't haven't compared at night as i said i haven't looked at all the literature so maybe somebody has done that but i think those are points that are still unexplored mind you the the challenges of the study increase exponentially yeah. uh, at yeah. night yeah. but um as you say with night vision goggles or something there still is a possibility yeah. Yeah. so don um with the truck uh someone else's comment susan uh, commented that you know this may be why by why birds seem unable to anticipate the speed of uh, windmills right and get struck by the windmill blades Mm. And we've talked the same about um, leashes and bells on cats. A lot of these things that humans understand, wildlife may not actually have a really good understanding of what a car does or what a, although it seems deer more or less have that figured out, but birds that are short-lived and, and don't have a long history with them um, might not recognize manufactured objects as being the same kind of threat as they would natural predators no i think that's that is the that is the point so what you know they have a rule of thumb to avoid a fast moving a faster moving predator appropriately but what happens when something goes from you know whatever you know 40 kilometers an hour at a high speed attack to uh to uh 200 and it's sort of uh you know there's a goose on the runway or when it takes off and so i that is the perspective that these um that these authors are taking, and it obviously has uh, it has conservation implications. But with the planes, it has major um, um, financial and uh, human risk uh, implications as well. So maybe we need to maybe we need to start painting the uh, faces of peregrine falcons <laughs> on the nose of airplanes. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So far, they've just gone to flashing red lights and things, but, not, but uh, yeah, it. Um, uh, I 
it, it's opening up uh, quite an area of of, uh, of uh, interesting uh, interaction. But um, you know, you always hear scientists say more data are needed, and that's certainly true here. Any other questions for Don? Well, if not, um, then I wish you all a very happy summer and, and successful birding till we see you again in the fall, maybe even some of you in person. The field trips, VNHS field trips do continue throughout the summer. So uh, be sure to check the VNHS calendar to see what's up. Uh, there'd probably be some, some bigger trips this year now that we seem to be almost back to normal on a lot of things. Um, lots of thank yous, Don, from people on uh, seeing this talk. And, and I personally thank you again for doing this research for us so we didn't have to. <laughs> Is it, um, it, it, when we, when, as people leave, will the chat still be available to me to just check through and yeah. see what, uh, yeah, okay, because so, I'd like to just look through and see if there's any other questions or comments in there. So, yeah, okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay, well, thank you everybody for, for attending. And uh, I see some of you around in the very various birding areas. So uh, you might have some other questions for me there and I'll be happy to tell you what I don't know or what I know.